webinar to do training and to help prepare for election day, making sure that you know how to best organize and get out the vote in your area. We've got a really good webinar planned for you tonight. And before we go to that, I want to let you know about another resource that Tea Party Patriot has available for you that you may not be aware of. Each Sunday night with the local coordinators, and local coordinators are our local leaders, presidents, chairmen, the people who are running a local, organ local Tea Party or liberty type organization around the country. Those who are associated with Tea Party Patriots get on a webinar with us each Sunday night and they vote on the issues and actions that we will take up as an organization. And during the webinar, they get a legislative update from one of the consultants that we have, whose name is Bill Pasco. And he does a, a legislative update letting them know the things that, to watch for on Capitol Hill in the week ahead. And during, during the August recess, he did updates just with things that we were hearing around D.C. and things to be watching for, and also a few updates from court cases and the White House. And now that Congress is back in session this week and over the next <coughs> couple of weeks, um, he, the updates are, are going to be focused on what Congress is doing. We have those updates in the written, we've had those updates in the written format available online for several, several months for people who want to go and read those updates. And we began recording those updates last night, and this was the first one that we recorded on the webinar, and it is available so you can listen to the update in addition to reading it if you're interested in doing that. And to get to that update, all you have to do is go to teapartypatriots.org, and then in the top right-hand corner, there's a section of the website that says My Government. And if you put your mouse over the words My Government, a drop-down menu appears, and in that drop-down menu it says Legislative Updates. You can click on Legislative Updates, and the first one will be in the top left-hand <coughs> or the middle of the screen on the left-hand side. You can click on the um, red circle with a white arrow in it next to our shield to be able to hear the, the audio from SoundCloud. And then you can read the text of the legislative update. And we're going to try this and see how people respond and if they like having the audio available in addition to the written format. And then later, in the year after we get past election day, we may try a couple of other ways to roll this out. But I wanted to let you know that's available for you, especially since Congress is back in session this week, and the continuing resolution has to be voted on by September 30th. The uh, current fiscal year for the United States government ends on September 30th, and the new year begins on October 1st. So we know that there will be some sort of movement with that over the next um, less than 10 or about 10 legislative days between now and the end of September. So be sure to check that out. And again, you go to teapartypatriots.org, hover over My Government, and then click Legislative Updates, and you'll get the legislative update that our consultant Bill Pasco does for the local coordinators each Sunday night. And next, we're going to go to Bill Norton, who works for Tea Party Patriots. He is from Arizona. He hand, he's our Constitution coordinator, and he also handles events and sponsorships around the country for various conferences that we do. And he does a lot of training, and um, especially in relation to the Constitution. And he is coordinating these webinars that you're participating on tonight. And he'll introduce our guest speaker, and he's going to be moderating the call. So thank you so much for being on tonight. I hope you learn a lot, and I look forward to listening to it and learning as well. Bill Norton, why don't you go ahead and take it from here? Great. Thank you, Jenny Beth. Appreciate the uh, information there on those legislative reports, and we're happy to uh, bring to you a great presenter tonight. Uh, those of you who had a chance to listen to our webinar last week on speaking the language of liberty, uh, we hope you enjoyed that and found that useful. And tonight we've got another. Uh, 
webinar that I think is going to be very informative for you uh, related to volunteer recruitment, voter registration, absentee ballots, and those types of things. Um, so tonight we have with us from the Leadership Institute, Christopher Doss. Now Chris's professional work and interests in politics have taken him to more than 40 states and 20 countries where he's met and worked with heads of state and members of parliament. He even took home a prime minister for uh, Thanksgiving one year, and another prime minister thanked him for not losing his soul while studying at the prime minister's alma mater for graduate school. Now Chris's interest in politics began when he accompanied his parents to the polls at age four, and he first wrote campaign scripts for radio spots and telemarketing in the 10th grade. He has worked in well over 100 political campaigns since then. After more than three decades in political work, including the administrations of three governors, a stint on Capitol Hill in Washington, and nearly 20 General Assembly sessions in Virginia and other states, Chris now serves as a lecturer for the Leadership Institute and travels around the United States and abroad teaching campaign and grassroots strategies. Chris did his undergraduate studies at Wake Forest University and his graduate studies at Norway's University of Oslo. He does consulting work as a principal consultant in revolutionary communications whose Facebook page he manages. So with that, we'd like to introduce Chris Doss. We, we appreciate you being here. And, uh, and we'll go ahead and let you take it from here and present this great information that you have for our audience. Bill, thank you so very much. I really appreciate it. And I'm a little hard pressed to uh, follow you. I think the Tea Party patriots around the country have a great resource with a trainer like you. And uh, I'm a little bit shy to uh, be training when I know they've got a trainer like you teaching them how to communicate. But I'll see what I can do to try and uh, fill some big shoes for a few minutes uh, today as we talk a little bit about what a campaign really is and what it means to be a volunteer organization. So we're going to start first by asking that question, what is a campaign? And everywhere I travel around this country and overseas, I'm struck by a sentence that I hear in some variation or other that reminds me of the church I grew up in. I talk to people about uh, what they're doing in their campaign, and I hear it over and over and over again. Well, this is the way we've always done it. Or they'll say, well, this is what we do here in fill in the blank, Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Penobscot, Maine, Genesee, South Carolina, or Moirana, Norway. Doesn't matter, that's what they say. What is a campaign? A campaign is talking to people. That's what it is. It's not yard signs. It's not TV ads. It's not billboards. It's talking to people. So let's go to slide number two here. And let's talk a little bit about volunteers. They are the heart and soul of all grassroots organizations. And a campaign is, in fact, a grassroots organization. A campaign is not that different from your Tea Party organization. And you're not multipliable. I'd like to make more of you, but I can't. And the election day is going to come on November 4th. And of course, in most states, there is no longer a constitutional election day because the left has turned election day into election month. And that means it's coming a lot earlier than November 4th. So in order to make more time, I've got to make more volunteers. That means we have to recruit more people because volunteers are the people who motivate others to act. And it's volunteers who define a campaign's identity. What do I mean by that? I mean over 90% of Americans will go to the polls and they'll vote for candidates whom they've never met, they've never interacted with. But who have they interacted with? They've interacted with you. They've interacted with volunteers. They've interacted with relatives, friends, or colleagues who have given them a reason to vote for the candidate whom they intend to pull the lever for or mark the ballot for. 
Now, in order to drive my point home about what a campaign is and what a campaign isn't, let's talk about gift certificates for a moment. What if I could give everyone listening tonight a gift certificate to go to any restaurant that they haven't tried in the state you're from, a gift certificate for four people, and a gift certificate to go see a movie afterwards. And I'm also going to give you a gift certificate to get a new cell phone, any cell phone you want. And I'm going to give you a gift certificate for a new pickup truck. Now, if you're not in the market for a new pickup truck, a new cell phone, if you haven't been to a movie lately and don't know exactly what to see, or you're not sure what restaurant to try, just what is it you do to make that decision? What predicates your decision? In the United States of America, when people are going to pick out a movie, a restaurant, a cell phone, or a new vehicle, what is the number one predicator of that decision? It is the advice of a friend. It's what they call word of mouth advertising. And that's what works in campaigns. And that's why grassroots Tea Party people can be so very important in the way that elections go. They define the campaign's identity. So we have to influence voters but we also have to recruit more people to join us as volunteers in campaigns. So let's go to the next slide, number three, and talk a little bit about recruiting volunteers. Now, I'm sure if you're like me, you've had family and friends tell you, don't walk in this house and start talking politics another time. I'm sick of hearing it. But in fact, it's our family and friends who know us and trust us and know we're passionate about the issues, and they recognize that we know our stuff, too. So start with family and friends anyway. Ask colleagues if you can, but don't get fired from your job, for heaven's sakes. But talk to the people who know you best because they're the ones who recognize your passion and your understanding of issues. Then after that, you're ready to start looking at former campaigns, political organizations. They may provide volunteers, but generally those are places where the people who are inclined to get involved in campaigns probably are going to without your prompting them. We ought to do a better job going to religious organizations. You know, in the 2012 and 2008 elections, Fewer than half of the people who describe themselves as believers actually bothered to vote. And of those who did, approximately half of them voted for the candidates who represented more government rather than the candidates who represented more liberty. We've got to do a better job with those organizations, letting them know that what they're voting for is not going to give them what they say they believe in. We need to pull them in to helping us out. Business organizations need to be confronted with the growing mountains of red tape that are being thrown at them, the growing taxes, uh, the growing burdens of running a business. They need to be told if you don't step up to the plate, it's just going to get worse. And both in terms of building our membership for our Tea Party organizations and in terms of recruiting volunteers for campaigns, we need to experiment with online recruiting, with Facebook, Twitter, Google Ads. Now, if you try Facebook ads and your first six or eight ads don't work very well, that doesn't mean that Facebook doesn't work for you. What it means is you haven't learned how to write or target your Facebook ads. So borrow your neighbor's 17-year-old son or daughter and have them come over and help you do the targeting you need to be doing with Facebook. It works. You just have to learn how to do it. And anytime you're doing door-to-door -door or telephone canvassing, when you run into people who say, oh, yeah, I'm on board with your candidates, the next thing you need to do is ask them, hey, well, wonder if you might be able to put in an hour one evening next week helping us out with some phone banking or stuffing some envelopes. Let's go to the 
the next slide, number four, because the key to all this is you have to ask. You have to be in evangelical mode all the time. You have to be a good missionary. You have to always be asking people, could you help us out a little bit? And if they say they can give you an hour, then you need to push them out the door after 58 minutes. Don't exploit them. Don't try to squeeze blood out of a turnip. If people know that you won't take advantage of them, they'll keep coming back. So don't use them for any more time than they've told you that they can commit to give you. Let's go to slide number five. When you're utilizing volunteers, you want to convey to them that most of the work we need to do in a campaign is pretty mundane stuff contacting voters, knocking on doors, calling them on the phone, uh, going to rallies and public events and talking to voters one-on-one. -on -one. That's pretty much what we need. But guess what? We'd like to know if you have any other skills or talents just in case something might come up. I know for me it's happened in every campaign I've worked in. And in fact, it's happened in almost every job that I've worked in. There will be some crisis, and the campaign or the organization I'm working for will reach out to Atlanta, Denver, New York, Washington, D.C., and they'll hire the, the biggest, most expensive PR firm they can find to help with some crisis communication. And they work with these consultants, and they get something crafted and decide they're going to do a postcard mailer to the audience they need to reach. And then they go to the most expensive printer who can churn something out overnight. And they ended up spending $257,000, but they got this thing out uh, in 72 hours. And what they neglected to figure out was this volunteer sitting in the, at the end of the table who comes in for three hours every morning of every day of the week. Well, that's a lady who just retired from the most famous PR firm on Madison Avenue in New York City. She could have done the whole thing for free for us. So know your volunteers. Create a catalog of their skills and talents so you know if something comes up, you've got somebody who can do it. You've got somebody who can write your letters to the editor. If you need a, a quick uh, speech to an odd audience that has to have a specially addressed speech written for them, you got somebody who can craft the turn of phrase for you. Look for campaign experience. Know your volunteers' issues and philosophical affinities. If you've got uh, a group of people coming in, sitting around the table to stuff envelopes, they're going to be chit-chatting. And you don't want to have the most adamant pro-lifer in your group sitting beside the most notorious pro-choice advocate in your community. Keep them separated. So knowing something about their issue and philosophical affinities will help you keep people working together more comfortably. Know their volunteers. Know their motivations. And sometimes people are motivated for different reasons. People are not always as philosophical as we are. Sometimes they're motivated simply because they like our candidate. Sometimes they're volunteering simply because they hate the other candidate. People are not always very sophisticated about political issues. So it's good to know why they're volunteering, and it helps to know that so you can keep them coming back. On slide number six, motivating volunteers, know to treat them right. Reward them. If you've got people coming in for phone banks, make sure you have something for them to drink. Take time to train new volunteers. Don't get impatient with people who haven't spent a lot of time working on campaigns. For someone who's never done phone banking or door-to-door -door canvassing, it can be a little strange. So do some role playing with those people so they'll know what they're up against. Even somebody who's never stuffed envelopes, that seems like a simple task. But take time to train them. Don't treat them like babies, but let them know that, that you'll help them out and let them know they can come back if they need some help. Remember their motivations. Give them a sense of ownership. 
let them know that there is no campaign without volunteers, that we live in a constitutional republic that's based on democratic participation, and therefore they are the reason for any campaign. People need to know that. They need to be involved for that reason. On slide number seven, the objective of having volunteers is so you have enough people who can do the persuasion to identify those swing voters, those undecided voters, those persuadable voters, to bring those people out of their bucket in the middle and bring them over into our favorable bucket. Because the other side is trying to do exactly the same thing. We're all targeting those same voters, the undecided, the swing voters, the persuadable voters. We're all trying to reach that same target-rich environment. If we can find out who are the persuadable voters, that's who we need to focus our time on. We need to bring those voters over. Yes. As we get closer to campaign day, uh, to election day, we need to get all our favorables to the polls. But at the moment, early September, we're still trying to nail down all the favorable voters, and we're trying to get the persuadable and swing voters to come over to our side. So that's what we're using our time for now, and that's why the contact of volunteers is so important with everyone we can reach. On slide number eight, voter contact methods are extremely important. Earlier, you heard me talk a little negatively about TV ads and yard signs. Well, why is that? TV ads really don't make personal contact with voters, and yard signs don't either. Door-to-door -door is still called the gold standard by most campaigners because door-to-door -door is that person-to-person, eyeball-to-eyeball, handshake-to-handshake contact that makes the most difference in any campaign. Now, it doesn't always have to be done on someone's stoop at someone's front door. You can replicate the door-to-door -door experience in many ways with voters. As long as you have an opportunity to speak to a voter face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball, nose-to-nose, handshake-to-handshake, you have an opportunity for that contact that is the most effective in all forms of campaigning. Now, I grew up in the Blue Ridge Mountains, and the county population was so sparse and so low, and the topography was so difficult that we could not go door to door. So we found a way to replicate the door to door experience. We had a, a good supporter in the county who had a store with a huge parking lot, a big country store, and we would have him set up a flatbed truck with um, some sound systems on it, and we'd bring musicians in, and we would mail postcards into the districts, the voting precincts that we needed to do door-to-door -door in. Since we couldn't, we'd mail postcards to them saying, we're going to have musicians at this country store on Saturday, September the 13th, and you get free homemade chocolate chip cookies and free lemonade. Come between 1.30 and 4.30, enjoy the music, uh, have some free refreshments, and guess what? people would actually come. They would actually show up, and we would work the crowd with our clipboards, keeping track of, of who we were talking to and talking to them about our candidates. And about every 10 minutes, we'd let the candidates get on stage, but we'd ne never let anybody have any more than about 90 seconds, and then we'd pull them off and put the musicians back up again. Never let anybody think that this was a political afternoon. Nope, this was a music afternoon. But we did get a few political speeches out of it about every nine or ten minutes. This was how we replicated the door-to-door -door experience. 
in a rural, sparsely populated, mountainous county where it would have been difficult to have done door to door. So anytime you can find a way to do this face-to-face -face campaigning, you can replicate the door-to-door -door experience, and that's the most effective kind of campaigning. Use your creative mind, use your intellect, and figure out how you can reach those voters. And it's the persuadable swing voters who are your best target audience. And most campaigns will have put a lot of time into figuring out where those persuadable voters are. So let the campaign tell you with the street sheets or the campaign targeting sheets that they've done. Follow those. Phone calls are the next most important because phone calls are personal, although they don't have quite the effectiveness of the face-to-face -face kinds of contacts. Direct mail, social media, and email can be effective when they are personal. Direct mail can be personalized either by making sure that you're sending a postcard to voters and it's a postcard that covers an issue that you've identified as an issue of interest to that voter, not just some generic postcard or some generic mailer from the candidate, but a mailer or postcard covering an issue that you have identified as interest to that voter. Another way you can personalize direct mail is have the campaign provide postcards to you that have room for you to write a note on it. And you write a, a note to voters you know, maybe to your Christmas card list, maybe to uh, people that you know on Facebook who live in the district. Uh, any voters that you might have any personal connection to, if you can add a note, hey, hope you'll vote for Jenny Beth. She's a great candidate. Take a look at her website. Any kind of personal note you put on direct mail adds to its effectiveness at least tenfold. Social media and email work the same way. When people see a posting on Facebook or when they get an email from the campaign, it has some effect. But if they get a personal message from you on Facebook, over 90% of people will read Facebook personal messages. So if you can send personal messages to all your Facebook friends who live in your district or who live in the area where your candidates are running, they're sure to read them and they have tremendous effectiveness in a campaign. And the same is true for email. Public events can be useful if you turn them into the door-to-door -door experience by working the crowd. And in every case, you need to keep track of everything you're doing because campaigns need to know whenever you've had a contact with a voter. And to the extent you keep track of all this and let the campaign know so they can put it into the database, it helps them be sure who they're going to turn out on election day, who they're going to make sure gets an absentee ballot, who they're going to make sure they get a ride to the polls for. House parties and meet and greets, eh, like public events, they can be good if you turn them into the door-to-door -door experience. TV, radio, print media, unless they are well targeted, they're not going to have much effectiveness. And even then, they don't have nearly the effectiveness of personal contacts. Don't ever buzz the hive. What does that mean? That means you won't, don't ever want to be doing anything that reminds the other candidate and the other side that there's an election going on. Keep your campaigning focused on persuadables and swing voters, and keep your voter turnout efforts focused on voters you have determined to be your favorables. Now, in a lot of places, because it is hard to have people meeting voters all the time. Sometimes you'll have a lot of volunteers during the middle of the day, no place for them to knock on doors, nobody at home for them to call. And we do something we call digital door-to-door. -door. We put uh, our volunteers down with two computers. On one of them, we have our voter list, and we tell them to check out voters on the second computer on their Facebook sites. 
So let's go to slide number nine and look at a picture, which is a screenshot of someone's likes on Facebook. What we do is we have people look up voters, say, see if you can find the Facebook page, make sure it's the same voter, not somebody with the same name, see if their Facebook page is public. Sadly, most Americans don't have any privacy settings for their Facebook page. So if it's public, we say go through their likes and see if you can determine if it's our voter or their voter. Now, if we don't know anything about this voter, we've been unable to reach them on the phone, we've never talked to them in door-to-door -door campaigning, and we don't know a thing about them. We need to know whether we want to turn them out in this midterm election. They've never voted in any primary before, so we don't have any inclination as to whether they really are a loyal party voter of one party or another. So on this particular screenshot of a voter's likes, Here's what happens. I look in and I see in the upper left-hand corner, I love teaching math. It's someone affiliated with teachers. I'm a little skeptical. I think teachers are dominated by the NEA and the American Federation of Teachers and maybe a leftist. Then I see she's a friend of Eagles. Well, is this some bird-loving environmental wacko? Hmm, I don't know. Then you see this next arrow pointing down to some ballet troupe. Oh, an artsy fartsy person, is this going to be a leftist? Then you go on down on the left hand side on the bottom, you see restore my climate. Okay, is this one of these global warming alarmists? And then I see another like that's a connection to a union. Oh, I'm getting kind of scared. And then in the middle row you see a yellow arrow that points to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Is this person a lefty? Well, no. On the right-hand side, I decide this is a voter I'm going to turn out because you'll see in the far right-hand column, Chick-fil-A. Hmm, that's a very good sign. And then in the next to the last column, in the middle, I see Ron Paul. They like Ron Paul. Then on the line next from the bottom, the two right-hand uh, icons, you see a little girl praying, and you see an icon of a Bible. We know it's a religious person. And then on the bottom row, I see both Ronald Reagan, and I see a light for another church. So we know now this is our voter. So without ever having talked to this voter, without ever having met this voter, without knowing anything about this voter from what we've seen on their voter history, I can tell from Facebook that this is a voter that I want to turn out in this election. This is someone who has some of the same values and principles that we have in liberty and values. So you can do a lot on Facebook. We call it digital door-to-door -door because it's like going door-to-door. -door but you're finding out about your voter by looking at their Facebook likes. And we build a profile on our database of voters. We fill it in with what we find out on Facebook. Now, when it comes to time to turning out voters, let's go to slide number 10, and let's look at what studies political scientists have done to figure out how you turn out your voters. The greatest study that's ever been done was done well over two decades ago by two professors named Green and Gerber. And they were looking at comparable lists of favorable voters in very similar precincts. And they were trying to figure out how much difference does it really make if you put a lot of time, money, resources, and volunteers into reminding your favorable voters that they need to get out and vote. And the tools they looked at were, first and foremost, do you have an absentee ballot vote by mail project for those voters? And then secondarily, for those who don't vote absentee, do you have voter turnout calls? Do you have voter turnout mail postcards? And do you have what Green and Gerber called in-person visits 
what we would call another round of door to door. And the way they checked this was they had a horde, an army of graduate students. They had lots of money for this study. And they looked at these comparable precincts with comparable levels of favorable voters. And they said, OK, what's the difference in these precincts? If in one precinct we do nothing, and if in the next precinct we make several rounds of phone calls to our favorable voters, how much difference will it make in turnout? Then let's try in yet a third precinct. We'll do phone calls, plus we'll send three sets of postcards. And in a fourth precinct, we'll do phone calls, postcards, and we'll also go door knocking. And let's see what difference it makes. So let's go to slide number 11 and see what they found out. They found out that if they would simply telephone all the favorable voters in a precinct, they could increase their favorable vote by 1%. If they added postcards, three postcards sent two weeks, one week, and two days before the election, they could add that to their phone calls, and the combination of phone calls and postcards would yield a two and a half increase in vote. But if they did phone calls, postcards, and they also visited and knocked on the doors, of these favorable voters, they could increase by a whopping 12.8%. So what does that tell us? That tells us that if you have a good, solid, favorable vote in any precincts where it is possible to do door-to-door, -door, that should be included in your voter turnout program. Now, the Green Gerber study was done in urban areas and they were looking at left-leaning candidates. And the problem for us is that conservative candidates, right-leaning candidates, liberty-minded candidates, unfortunately find their strongest precincts in rural areas, making it very difficult for us to include door-to-door -door in our voter turnout programs. But it tells us that whenever we have that possibility, where we have neighborhoods or precincts that are favorable to us, and where we have a few of those that have densities that make it possible to do door-to-door, -door -door, we should include that. But if we don't, then we darn well better remember that we have to really get out our phone calls and our postcards to get our favorable vote out. Now, people who look at all this and say, yeah, I can do all of that, they think by looking at the Green Gerber study, they're going to get a huge turnout. And it's not going to happen. You're not going to replicate what these professors did with a lot of money and a lot of graduate students. But you can get turnout of a point or two. And I need to remind you of the 2010 election. That was a wave election. And we only got about two percentage points higher than normal in that election. So if we could really turn out election, uh, get about a 2% higher turnout, we could really change things and shake them up a little bit. So let's go to slide number 12 and talk about how we start our effective get out the vote programs. And it starts with absentee ballot and early voting. Remember, some states call it early voting. Some states just call it absentee ballot. But voting starts in October in most states. So we have to identify those people who will have to vote by absentee or early voting. And some of them will have to do it by mail, because some will be living distantly, some serving in the military overseas. They'll need to get applications for a postal ballot or mail ballot if they're not in those few states that automatically do mail ballots. They have to be tracked. And they have to be tracked for the complicated process, because except for those few postal ballot states, a person has to apply for the absentee ballot. You send an application in to your 
voting director, voting registrar, or voting official, then that person sends the actual absentee ballot to the soldier, sailor, or student. They fill out the ballot and send it back. So it's a multi-part process, and it requires you to follow up with the voter, either by email or telephone, to make sure that each step of the process is taking place and taking place quickly. Follow up, make sure everybody does each step as they're supposed to. Once cast, these votes are in the bank, and we can forget about it and move on, and that's what we want to do. We want to get these votes in the bank. Let's move on to slide number 13. Who are we looking at for absentee ballots and early voting? Well, first and foremost, military and students. Now, be careful with students. Just because mom and dad are very conservative, very liberty-minded, that doesn't mean that their son or daughter who's out uh, studying at the University of California at Berkeley, that kid may not be quite so conservative or liberty-minded. So make sure before you're getting these ballots in the hands of these students that you know how they're going to vote. Pay careful attention to homebound voters, patients, and people in nursing homes. I hear it all the time from people I talk to. They'll tell me, oh, my mother can't vote. She's not capable of voting. And I'll say, have you looked at the voting record? She's voted in the last three elections. They'll argue with me. I'll say, I'm sorry, but voting records are public information, and I've seen the votes. Your mother voted in the last three elections. Well, how could that be? Well, it could be that either the nursing home staff came in and helped her vote, or somebody from the other party came in and helped her vote. So you better figure it out, because she'll vote again, and you won't know it. And if you think she's not capable of voting, you better figure out who's voting for her. Remember, every state has very flexible possibilities for people who commute long distances or people who are away on business. Get them to vote. Get as many people to vote by absentee or early voting as can legally do so, because you never know who's going to have uh, a flat tire on election day, who's going to have a daughter who's going to sprain her ankle, or who's going to have a debilitating migraine headache on election day. So we need to encourage our people to vote early or take advantage of absentee balloting if they legally can do so. The more we can get to do that, the more security we have because those votes are in the bank once they're cast. Slide number 14, remember effective get out the vote programs include personal canvassing if you've got precincts that are worthwhile to do door-to-door -door in and are sufficiently densely populated to make that possible. Always include phone operations to your favorable voters, postcards or lit drops to those people, and on slide 15, do not forget new media. We have to remind voters to vote in every possible way. And that means use Facebook and social networking tools. Text messages to those voters who have given, who have volunteered their addresses to the campaign, Twitter and email. So you need to be Facebook messaging everybody. You need to be tweeting if you have a Twitter account. And you need to be emailing. Remember, lots of people will not bother to open your email. So you have to get the synopsis of your message and the subject line of your email. And on the next slide, number 16, don't forget earned media. If you're in a rural area, and that rural area is usually good for conservative and liberty-minded candidates, you want to get your local, yokel, weekly, or bi-weekly paper to focus on the election. Here, there's a picture of a little girl sitting in a mountain of papers. Her father was running for state legislature in a state, and he wanted to visualize the regulatory burden. He had one city that was left-leaning, 
and two rural counties that were right-leaning. And the two rural counties had a bi-weekly paper that came out on Monday and Friday of every week. So he did a press conference on Saturday before the election, had his cute little daughter sit in this mountain of regulations, and he talked about the burden of regulations on small businesses. And guess what? Both of these rural papers ran a picture of that cute daughter on the front page of the Monday edition, and that was a great reminder to people in these rural counties to go vote. It also meant that in these rural counties, the vote was about two percentage points higher than it normally would have been. So that was a great get out the vote effort. On slide number 17, I want to remind you to always have poll watchers. On the inside, you check all favorable voters, and on the outside, you stand out sample ballots. And last but not least here, make your phone calls to anybody who hasn't, hasn't voted. Your election day program has to have phone calls to the people that by 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock, if your favorables haven't voted, call them, get them to the polls. Slide number 19, remember a campaign is a name game. It's data. It's knowing who your voters are and getting them to the polls. Thank you very much. I've done that without taking a breath. And if we have a moment to take a question and a half, I'd be happy to answer a question and a half. Well, thank you so much, Chris. A lot of uh, very, very good information. And um, we sure appreciate you being on with us tonight. Uh, as you can see, Chris did a, a very good overview, got into as much detail as he could, but you know, there's just so many different things to keep in mind when you're running campaigns, getting uh, uh, volunteers, and, and uh, so we sure appreciate your insight. Uh, clearly, you have a tremendous amount of knowledge in this area. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and ask Shelby Blakely. She's on our uh, national support team and helps out. Uh, with the webinar, and if she has any housekeeping items that we need to uh, introduce to the audience, Shelby, about questions and, and how we can take questions, and then uh, Shelby's going to kind of uh, moderate those questions for us. So go ahead, Shelby. Sure. Thanks, Bill. All right, there's two ways you can ask questions. The first way would be to raise your hand. And how that's done is on the webinar software window, you will see a little icon that is in the shape of a hand. If you click that, it will raise the hand and let us know you have a question, and we'll be able to call on you. If you are using a telephone, uh, that's fine. If you're using a microphone and speakers on your computer, we recommend that you make sure your microphone is working uh, so that we will be able to hear you when we call on you. The other way to ask a question is to type it into the question log, where we will be able to see it and can ask it on your behalf. Uh, so. First, we will go to Myra de la, uh, de la Escuela. Go ahead, Myra. All right, My Myra, we're not able to hear you. So I'm going to go ahead and lower your hand. And if you're able to uh, correct your microphone problem, raise your hand again, and we'll get back to you. Uh, let me take a look at the question log. We have no hands up at this point. Um, Jim England would like to know, uh, where do you apply for a voter? We lost you there, Shelby. Are you with us? Uh, yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, Jim England has a question. Uh, he wants to know, where do you apply for a voter turnout list? Uh, in each state, the law is slightly different. but in every state, there are rules that allow a campaign or a candidate to get the voter rolls that will show you who has voted in which elections. The laws are slightly different in each state. In some states, they provide it for free. In some states, they charge for it. But in every state, a candidate for office or a campaign can, can get access to the full and complete list. Additionally, in each state, any voter can go to the office that maintains the voter records and look at them. But you cannot necessarily walk out with a full list. 
but candidates can get the list for the office they're running for, for the district or the county or the city or township they're running for. But the laws are different in every state in terms of uh, what they have to do to get it and whether or not they have to pay for it. So in my home state, uh, uh, Chris, in my home state, Arizona, um, the political parties have passed laws that make it so that political parties can get the lists um, for free, and then they can give it to their candidates. Um, so if, if anybody, if you're a precinct committee man or you're involved in, in that way at all, sometimes you can get lists that way as well. At least you can in Arizona, so I don't know what it's like in other states. Yeah, and in, in, in uh, most states, the political party does maintain a list and you can get it directly from the political party, although it may not have very much information other than the names of voters, and it may not even have the most recent election information telling whether or not they voted. But in every state of the union, the, the political parties have the voter lists, but they just simply may not have much information on them. All right. Our next question comes from Boric Valeric. Go ahead, Boric. Yeah, hi. Uh, I have very good friends. Our children have been playing together since childhood. Childhood. Now the children are grown up, moved out, got married. But the family votes Democratic, no matter what. They we are good friends. We have dinners together. Everything but they don't want me to send them political information via email, stuff like that. How do we treat people like this? <laughs> uh, I, I, I write them off. There, there, are, there are a certain percentage of Americans who are going to be uh, voting Democrat. There are a certain percentage of Americans who are going to be voting Republican. In the United States of America, only two-thirds of the population is eligible to register to vote. The rest are children, felons, uh, aliens, and they're not eligible to register. But only 40% actually register to vote. In the United States, roughly 10% of Americans will show up to the polls and vote Democrat no matter who's running. Roughly 9% will show up and vote Republican no matter who's running. Roughly 3% of Americans are single-issue voters who tend to vote for a, for a particular party, but they are focused only on one issue, and they'll abandon their traditional party if they think it's not being good for them. When you analyze all the people who could be voting, would be voting, should be voting, could be open-minded and are not, what you end up with is there are fewer than 3 to 4% of Americans who are actually persuadable swing voters. That's all. That's it. And that's who we're trying to find. And that's who we're trying to persuade. And it's just as important for us to keep track on our databases and on our voter lists of those who are not persuadable. And if these are people who are not persuadable, who are not going to listen, then we need to keep track of those people and not waste our time with them. And that's what it sounds like you've got there. All right. Our next question comes from Alice Edwards. Uh, she says, I broke my foot and can't get out of my home. How can I help get out the vote? Well, phone calling is, is, the, is the best thing. And uh, phone calling, volunteering with a campaign is, is easy enough to do. Call the campaign, say, I'm, I'm in my home, I've got to work from home, what can I do? Or simply calling uh, through friends, through uh, uh, Christmas card lists, or contacting people. If you're on Facebook, contacting people on Facebook. If you're on email, contacting people on email. Uh, those are excellent ways to help remind people that there's an election and remind people who the best candidates are. 
Uh, so you can either do it through a candidate and campaign, uh, let them know that, that you have to work from home, this is what I want to do, uh, or you can simply start on your own by working through Christmas card lists, sending notes, sending simple postcards or simple notes to people that you have addresses for who live in the district or state uh, for which you're campaigning for a candidate. Um, or um, making phone calls to those people. Um, there are any of these kind of voter contact methods you can use with your friends, your Christmas card list, your Facebook friends, your email list. And the more different ways you contact them, the more likely they are to pay attention. So send them a postcard, send them a note, plus send them a Facebook message or an email, plus pick up the phone and say, hey, just want to make sure you got my message. And it, it, these redundant contacts are very useful. You think, oh, I hate to badger them. No, you're not badgering them. You're, you're just making sure they got your message. All right. I do believe that is the last question in the question log. Um, I'm sorry, we've got one popping up right now. Uh, Rob Boyson says, um, he, he mentions that most campaigns today have the ability to have their phone banking volunteers uh, access the campaign's phone bank from their home or a specific location that the campaign sets up, correct? Yeah, that is, that is correct, although the ones that have um, home-based calling generally have it hooked up with a computer. Um, so it's becoming more and more common for people to be able to call from home uh, but when that's done, it's usually done through a computer, but not always. But it, it's wise to call the campaign and ask them, uh, say, what can I do from home? Can I call from home? And they'll tell you uh, what kind of equipment you need, whether you need a cell phone, a computer, or what. So just call the campaign. But it's becoming more and more and more common for campaigns to be able to use you uh, from home. All right, our last question comes from Landra Skelly. Uh, she says, after participating in phone banking, I have found that most people do not answer their phones, are irritated with contacting them, and a few have positive responses. Maybe using more options such as social media would be more effective, but the Democratic Party has the social media lockup when it comes to elections. What is your opinion? Uh, my opinion is that, is that not all campaigns are that ineffective. If you if you worked on a campaign that had bad phone lists, then you had a bad uh, experience, but not all campaigns have lists that are so bad that you're getting nobody at home or you're getting people who were the wrong people to have called. Uh, some campaigns have better phone lists than that. And not all of the campaigns that are clever with social media are democratic campaigns. I work in a lot of campaigns that do extremely well with social media, and I happen to be a person who doesn't work with Democrats. So um, you should keep demanding that the candidates you work with become more sophisticated in the types of lists that they're forcing on volunteers, and you should keep demanding that they learn how to do social media because the left will have an advantage over us as long as they have better phone lists and better social media. They will beat us if we don't do it, but I've worked in too many campaigns where we do have candidates on the right and candidates and parties other than the Democratic Party who have sense enough to do it right. So people like you who know it's being done wrong need to stand up and scream and say, we need to learn how to do this right. Uh, I wouldn't be out training all over the United States and the world if I didn't believe that we could do it right, and I know we can do it right, and that's why I do what I do. So keep demanding that uh, we not do these schlocky, crappy kinds of campaigns and keep demanding that they learn how to do it right. It's the only way we're going to win. All right. Um, we have quite a few uh, questions up on the question log asking for the resources and the information. Uh, I should remind you that we will be sending an email to all of the attendees with the resources from this call 
plus a link to the call from last week. And you will be able to look for that in your email tomorrow. Bill, back to you. Great. Thanks, Shelby. And Chris, we sure appreciate you being with us uh, this evening. We, we, uh, I'm sure that the information was very valuable to our listeners. And um, we sure appreciate all the hard work that you've done over the years. It's made it possible for us to then tap into all that hard work and let you share that with us tonight. So thank you for uh, joining us. And those of you who are on the webinar, we thank you for joining us as well. And we encourage you to... Uh, to tune in again next week uh, when we will have some information about uh, effectively running Tea Party uh, meetings or Liberty uh, Liberty Group kind of meetings, uh, give you some great pointers on how to get people to your events and how to operate those events so that they are successful and meaningful uh, to your attendees. And so we are thankful that you could all join us tonight. And uh, unless you have any final housekeeping items, Shelby, I think we will call it a night. That is it. Thanks, everyone, for attending, and we'll see you next week.